This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org to discover more shows like this one. The darkness awaits. History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. you spooktacular people welcome to this 277th episode of the history ghost bump podcast ghost tours for the theater of the mind i am your host diane October has started our favorite month. On this episode, I have a location that is reputedly quite haunted. As a matter of fact, its reputation for being haunted surpasses its reputation for being a museum. This is a very small neighborhood museum, but you've probably seen it on one of the ghost programs that you watch. This is Iron Island Museum, and I'm looking forward to bringing this to you This is located in Buffalo, New York, and I'm starting to think that Buffalo, New York is quite haunted. I think this is our third location in that city. Before we get into that, I want to welcome into the Spooktacular crew, Amanda Kirsten, who has such an interesting way of spelling her name, K-U-R-S-T-Y-N. That's amazing. I love that. Kelsey with an E-Y, Amanda, Brandon, Mary with a Y, Anna, Alex, Terry with an I, Ashley with an E-I-G-H. Tracy with an E-Y, Elizabeth, Jamie with an I-E, Becky with a Y, Brittany, Janae, Jenny with a Y, and Craig, one of the co-hosts of the Spectral Asylum podcast. If you need something else creepy to listen to, I suggest that podcast. It's very good. Welcome to the Spooktacular crew, everybody. And now, this moment in oddity. Many people have heard of the hollow earth theory, but not many know that a cult of followers of this belief had once built their very own utopia. Today, that utopia is known as Koreshian State Historic Site. Cyrus Teed was born in 1839 and he became a physicist and alchemist. One day, Teed claimed that God spoke to him and told him to start a new religion. Teed was to take the name of Koresh and call this new religion Koreshianity. The core belief of the group was that the earth and sky existed inside the inner surface of a sphere, which is one unique interpretation of the hollow earth theory. Teed claimed that Jesus was the sixth messiah and that he himself was the seventh messiah. In 1894, the group moved to the small Florida town of Estero and began building what they called New Jerusalem. At their peak, the community had 250 residents. He died in 1908 and the group's numbers began to decline and the final Koreshian died in 1961. The community was deeded to the state of Florida before that and was turned into a state historic site. So today, you can canoe the river near the Seven Sisters Planetary Court and stop in to see the models of the universe that have the Earth inside a concave sphere. And that certainly is odd. Scared yet? Boo! (laughs) And now, this month in history. In the month of October, on the 7th in 1816, the first double-decked steamboat named the Washington arrived in New Orleans. 
Henry M. Shreve designed the Washington, and that design would prove to be ideal for Western rivers. That original design included elements that we associate with the classic steamboat powering up the Mississippi. A two-story deck, a stern-mounted paddle wheel powered by a high-pressure steam engine, a shallow, flat-bottomed hull, and a pilot house framed by two tall chimneys. The currents of the mighty Mississippi were tackled in record time for the Washington, which managed to reach Louisville in only 25 days after leaving New Orleans. The flat-bottomed hull was perfect for the shallow western rivers. Soon, other paddle wheelers were produced, and at the peak of the era, there were 740 steamboats traveling the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. The boom ended by the late 19th century as the railroad started taking over. The Iron Island Museum is said to be the perfect spooky spot for anyone in western New York to enjoy a little Halloween fun. For those of us who celebrate Halloween year-round, this museum is the perfect spot for a ghostly encounter. The tales of experiences are numerous, and this location has been featured in multiple paranormal television shows. The museum showcases the charming and proud history of the Lovejoy neighborhood in Buffalo. Memorabilia is a sight to see, and the place is crammed so full, it takes several hours to enjoy it all. And perhaps this is why the place is so haunted, all that memorabilia. Or could it be the former use for the building causing the hauntings? Join me as I explore the history and hauntings of the Iron Island Museum. Many of you listen to the show in a variety of ways. If possible, you are going to want to have some headphones nearby because I'm going to be playing you some EVP that have been caught at this location. They're pretty creepy, so I think you'll want to hear them. So I didn't know anything about the Iron Island Museum. And the first thing that comes to mind when you hear Iron Island is, oh, this must be an island somewhere in New York. Although Buffalo, I don't think there's any islands nearby. So I was like, hmm, wonder where this name comes from. It's actually a nickname that not too many people use nowadays. People who've lived in the Lovejoy neighborhood will remember this from years gone by, but not too many people in our current era use it. But that was the nickname for the Lovejoy neighborhood that's in Buffalo, New York. And the reason why it got this nickname is because it's bordered on its perimeter by railroad tracks. So the big thing in this city was the railroad, and many people came there to work for the railroad, and this includes lots of immigrants. The neighborhood was settled by Italian, German, and Irish immigrants. Eventually, migrants from the rural south would come later, but the area has continued to be dominated by Italians. I was really excited to see this name Lovejoy because there was a period of time when I lived in hell, I call it. It was Laramie, Wyoming. My apologies to any of you who live in that area, but it really was hell to me because I hate cold and wind, and that's basically what Laramie has all the time. But when I worked there, I worked in a restaurant called Elmer Lovejoy's. So when I saw the name Lovejoy, it took me back, gosh, 26 years to when I worked there. So kind of fun. Interesting side note. A little bit about this Elmer Lovejoy's. It was a brand new bar and grill that they were building in Laramie, and I was part of the opening team for it. I was such a good employee there that they moved me down to another restaurant that they owned that was the big fancy French restaurant. And this location was haunted. It used to be a bordello, and there was a woman who haunted it. I would hear stuff from the various wait staff that would have to go down into the cellar, which is where we kept all of the foodstuffs, the wine, the beer, all that good stuff. And a lot of them wouldn't want to go down there alone. They would talk about cold feelings. There were a few that had actually seen an apparition. I will tell you, I would not go down there by myself. So if I'm up on the line and all of a sudden we needed a can of tomatoes or something, I was like, okay, one of you guys is going downstairs with me because I'm not going down into the closet by myself. I never did have any experiences there, which is kind of a bummer because now it would be really cool to me if I had. But uh, it was just kind of one of those memories came back to me hearing that name. But actually, the name for the Lovejoy neighborhood comes from something else. And it gets its name from Sarah Lovejoy. She was an American who was killed during the War of 1812. And this actually happened in December of 1813. As we all know, the War of 1812 didn't just take place in 1812. There was a British raid on Buffalo. 
most of the men from the settlement went to a place called Black Rock to defend against the British attack, so they weren't in their hometown. Sarah remained behind with her 12-year-old son, who was named Henry. When she heard news that the British and Native Americans were arriving in Buffalo and were going to attack, she sent Henry into the woods because she figured it would keep him safe from being kidnapped and that the raiders would not harm a woman. The Native Americans ransacked the house and Sarah fought with them as she tried to save her property. You know, they were trying to take things and she's like, don't take my quilt and here's some dishes. Don't take my dishes. Legend claims she stated, when my property goes, my life shall go with it. During the melee, she was stabbed with a tomahawk and her body was dragged into the yard. The neighbors put her body in the house after the troops left. The next day, the British burned much of the settlement and Sarah's body was burned up with her house. There is a cenotaph in Forest Lawn Cemetery in the Buffalo area to honor Sarah and also a memorial in Mumford Rule Cemetery near her parents in her honor. So that is where the Lovejoy neighborhood gets its name from. So basically, ladies, if you put up a fight for your stuff, you could get a neighborhood named after you. No guarantees, but I mean, it's happened. See, the Iron Island Museum is dedicated to preserving the memory of the Lovejoy neighborhood, and it has its home in a building donated in August of 2000 by businessman Anthony Amagon. The building was formerly a church and a funeral home that dates back to the late 1800s. Anthony decided to donate the property when he heard about the efforts of the Iron Island Preservation Society of Lovejoy, Inc. The Preservation Society was formed in 1994 with the mission to preserve and beautify the Iron Island neighborhood and improve the quality of life for the residents. They've done a lot of fundraisers to beautify the parks and have held various events. And they initially had a storefront that they were keeping as their museum. When Anthony heard about this and how crammed it was in the storefront, he said, you know what? I have a building for you. Can you imagine if you're trying to run this not-for-profit museum and you get a call from somebody who just wants to give you a building? That's amazing. The museum celebrated its grand opening in October of 2000 and features military uniforms, railroad memorabilia, of course, a wooden altar from a neighborhood 1896 church, and a model of the New York Central Terminal. The history of this building starts with a small wooden church that was on the site in the late 1800s, and a parsonage was erected to the west at 994 Lovejoy Street. The brick church that is there now was erected in 1883 and opened in 1885 by a Methodist Episcopal church. For some reason, the church building was abandoned for a short while starting in the 1940s. They just closed, so I don't know if they decided to move to a different location, if the church just didn't have enough membership. I'm not exactly sure why. But it sat there for a little bit abandoned and nobody was using it. It was bought in 1956 by a funeral director who used it as a funeral home known as Church Funeral Home. Inside, it's almost like a building within a building. There's an area with three viewing rooms that was added inside and then an apartment was attached to it as well. I think so that the funeral director could live near the home. If you were to take apart these three viewing rooms, it would look like the church on the inside again. So it's been preserved really well. I think they just wanted to break up the fact that it was one big room so that they could have several viewings if needed. Three different funeral directors ran the home up until it was donated. So it didn't pass through too many hands. Iron Island Museum has a well-known reputation for being haunted, and they embrace it offering ghost tours and overnight investigations if you so choose. Ghost Lab and Ghost Hunters have featured the location on episodes as well. I believe it was on my ghost story, too. The museum itself has also made a 45-minute documentary called Hauntingly Charming, and it has a bunch of personal accounts and actual investigative footage of hauntings at the museum. This documentary was made by the Adventure Myths Group, and they stayed for a full 24-hour period at the museum. And their goal was to document paranormal evidence, and they claimed to have caught unexplained audio, and a child EVP that they said would frighten most hardcore skeptics. Now, there are many reasons why this museum could be haunted. First and foremost, we all know about haunted objects and how things can attach to objects. Here you have a museum that is just full of memorabilia, and a lot of it is from the World War I and II era. So these could be things that belong to fallen soldiers. There might have been a lot of emotion involved with that. But we also had some human cremains that were left here when the funeral home closed up. I clean houses for a living. 
I've had a few of my clients decide to move to a different location, especially some of the elderly ones. They move out of their home into an assisted living place or something of that nature. I've had people leave things behind in refrigerators, maybe in a closet. They might have forgotten an article of clothing or a box of something. I can tell you I have never found cremated remains left anywhere. And I'm trying to figure out how you leave a bunch of them. I think there was up to 24 containers at this location. That's a lot of human remains to just leave behind. The sad thing about that is that means those people were never claimed by anybody. And that really sucks. When Ghost Hunters was here, they captured evidence and had experiences. One of the investigators, I believe it was Chris, was standing in the hall speaking to another team member when she saw a shadow shape move in front of the door and then the door opened and closed. We hear a lot about opening doors and closing doors and obviously there's lots of ways to debunk that. Could be a breeze, air conditioning kicks on, floors a little tilted, settling, who knows. But what was weird about this one is that the door had been locked. So they were trying to figure out how a door that was locked was open and closed. Grant climbed the ladder to the old church attic and he claimed to see a dark figure and a voice seemed to emanate from it and it was coming at him. So he decided to get out of the attic. It made him very uncomfortable. The group captured disembodied footsteps and voices and some other EVP. Visitors and employees claim that there are two spirits of six-year-old boys who were both waked at the funeral home hanging around the museum. Those wakes took place back in the 1960s. Nobody's quite sure why these boys have decided to stick around. Kind of weird that they both happen to be the same age as well. The psychic Karen Reese visited for a lecture, and during her talk, she mentioned that an orb was hovering over a man that was standing in the back. This man was a skeptic, so he just kind of shrugged his shoulders and said, "Uh, yeah, right, there's an orb above my head. Anyway, move on or keep talking. Well, there was somebody else who was in the room and they turned around and decided to snap a picture of him. And when they looked at the picture, lo and behold, there was an orb clearly visible above his head in the picture. Now, most of the time I kind of blow off orbs as just dust or a bug or something like that. But the fact that this went with a psychic saying, I see an orb above your head, which usually you don't see with the naked eye. And then somebody captures it on camera in the same location. That's a little bit weird. I will give them that. Cindy from Ontario posted on TripAdvisor, I was taking pictures with my cell phone in the attic room when it inexplicably took two pictures automatically in slow succession. I swear I did not do anything to my phone to make it take those pictures, and my friend witnessed the whole thing as well. A few of the girls felt the spiderweb feeling brushing against their arms a few times. Now, we are in an attic. It is possible that it actually was spiderwebs. We also think we caught an EVP while recording our conversation. Sounds like a male voice, but cannot clearly make out what was said. Not sure if any of these things were truly paranormal. My husband is still a huge skeptic. Mind you, he wouldn't go down in the basement by himself in the dark. All in all, we had such a fun and enjoyable evening and would recommend this experience to others. So I always love it when you got the skeptics that don't want to go down in the dark. It's like, well, if there's nothing to it, why are you afraid to go downstairs? (laughs) Oh, I love it. Linda Hostrader is one of the owners of the Iron Island Museum, and she says that she didn't really realize that the place was haunted when they first moved the museum into the building, but it didn't take long for her to have her first ghost experience, and that happened in December of 2000. The museum was hosting a Christmas party, and Linda was in the kitchen prepping stuff when she heard tables and chairs being moved around in the front room. Not a problem if you have a group setting up, but when you're in the building alone, little bit of a problem. Linda made her exit quickly and she called a volunteer to join her in checking out the building. Just seeing, did somebody come in? Is it safe? They wandered throughout the entire building. Not only did they not find anybody, but nothing had been moved. The tables and chairs were exactly as they'd been. So what was making the moving noise or if this was a spirit, did they put everything back the way it had been? I don't know. One of the best stories to come out of here is about one of the more famous ghosts that's here. His name is Edgar Zernicki. Edgar was 87 when he died in 1992, and I searched him out and I found his Find a Grave bio. Edgar had been a Marine who fought in the Sandino Rebellion in Nicaragua in 1928, and he later joined the Navy in the early 1930s. He eventually moved to Buffalo, and he lived in the East Delayan area working as a tool and dye maker. 
His remains were cremated, and when the funeral home was closed, the remains of Edgar, along with seven other soldiers, were left in the basement in quart-sized paint cans. And I believe there were cremains of up to 20 to 24 people, as I said earlier. I'm not sure if some of those other people were not soldiers then, and why stories that I read about Edgar always put him with these seven other soldiers, because they're all going to get buried together. First of all, we have to ask the question, why is Edgar here? How come nobody came to pick up his cremains? Well, it would seem that he was one of those crusty old guys, maybe not a real nice guy in his life. There are multiple stories told about him, but one of the things that I had read is that he might have gotten a girl knocked up, and he claimed that he had not done that, so he just kind of takes off and leaves her alone. Later on, they end up marrying each other. So I'm not sure if there was some making up somewhere in there or if maybe he really didn't abandon her, but eventually they end up married to each other. Now, this child that supposedly he had gotten her pregnant with, I don't know where she goes to because it seems that he and his wife had adopted two children. So right there, I'm not sure that that story about him getting her knocked up and leaving her, whatever, has any basis in truth. He seems to have become estranged from his children. One was a girl and one was a boy. And when the son was caught up with later on, he thought that his sister had taken care of things. So I'm not sure what all happened there. It sounds like they were not a real tight-knit family. But that's how Edgar ended up getting left here. Now, I'm not exactly sure if the cremains had some kind of marking on them or numbers or what have you, but nobody knew who was in what when it came to these paint cans. I think many of my listeners have probably heard of the very well-known psychic and medium Chip Coffee. He's one of the few that I lean towards him probably being the real deal. And this story is one of the reasons why that could be the case. Chip had come to the museum and he was walking around doing an investigation and he went up into the attic. And while he was up there, Linda joined him and he looked at Linda and he goes, I'm really getting a strong sense of the letter E. I believe your ghost that is here, his name begins with an E, but he couldn't get the rest of it. He continues looking around and then before he's leaving, he turns to Linda and he says, I'm getting the rest of the name. It's Edgar. Linda didn't really think anything of it, but a short time later, she was going through some of the records there, and there was a list of names that was connected to these cans that they had found, some kind of record or something. And anyway, she's looking at them. She sees the name Edgar Zernicki, and she's like, I wonder if that's our ghost, Edgar. Because of that, they were able to identify the other soldiers that were in the cans. All of those cans were escorted with Edgar by the Patriot Guard riders to the cemetery, and they were laid to rest at the Bath National Cemetery in September of 2010 with full military honors. Now, generally speaking, you would think that this would give a spirit rest, but apparently Edgar likes to stick around, so they claim that he is still haunting the building. But now he seems to be a little bit happier, and psychics say that he seems to be walking around with a puffed-out chest, like, now everybody knows who I am, and I've had my military burial, or something like that. But I just thought this was a really cool story, because these men had been given a proper military burial and that that all came about because of something on the paranormal side of things. So just one of those positive things that can occasionally happen when it comes to hauntings. All right, so you want to hear some EVP? I've got a few of them for you. There appears to be a ghost here named Tommy, and I don't know if this is one of the boys. What I'm going to do with these EVP is play them for you a couple of times, and then I'll tell you what everybody thinks is being said. That way you're not going to prejudge something before you get to listen to it with your own ears. Yeah, I put him in there because he was, con- he was the conductor, and I said, well, Yeah, I put him in there because he, con- he was the conductor, and I said, well, So that was Tommy, who they believe is one of the child ghosts, asking for company, they think. Here's the next one. So if you want to play with that, and then if you could talk into the red light that's near the boat. Oh. So if you want to play with that, and then if you could talk into the red light that's near the boat. Oh. They believe that Tommy is responding to Greg and saying boat. This next one is a little bit creepy.
That sounds to me like it's an older voice and it's somebody who's a little bit chilly saying, I'm cold. Here's the next one. Sounded like gunfire to me. Here's the next one. Are you associated with anything in this room? Are you associated with anything in this room? They believe this one is saying, I want to go home. Here's the next one. What I do, Jeff? Oh, right. What I do, Jeff? Oh, right. This one seems to be saying Linda's name. Here's the next one. Here it sounds like a ball falling, then a child saying, that falls down for you, and then a woman saying, yes. Here's the next one. They believe that's a ghost cat. So apparently we have a ghost cat in the building. These next couple are not so nice. Shadow man's a cuss. He's not even here right now. I swear to God, he touched my ear earlier. Oh. Shadow man's a cuss. He's not even here right now. I swear to God, he touched my ear earlier. Oh. They believe that one is Oh Christ, I Hate You. That was captured in September of 2008. And then there's this one. That sounds like a yelling man, and that was from November of 2008. Here's the next one. Big time creep. Big time creep. This one, they believe, might have been a little bit of German. You first hear George, which seems to be the ghost identifying itself as George. And then it's saying what sounds like big time creek, which they think might be not creek like as in C-R-E-E-K, but Krieg is in Blitzkrieg, K-R-I-E-G, a battle of some sort. So what do you guys think? Did you hear any of those? I know it's a little hard for them to come across on a podcast. But to me, it sounded like there was some strange stuff going on there. Iron Island Museum is a quaint little museum. There are people who will tell you, oh, it's full of junk. But for those of us who like memorabilia and such, I don't see it as being full of junk. And anything that has ghosts involved with it is very cool in my book. So I would love to check out Iron Island Museum. Are there entities attached to some of the memorabilia here? Are there spirits here? Is Edgar a ghost? Is the Iron Island Museum haunted? That is for you to decide. Well, I don't know if I will ever get a chance to be up in Buffalo. Maybe I'll check out Niagara Falls. But if I do, definitely want to check out this museum. And it's really cool because it looks like it's very affordable to do overnights there. So it'd probably be a fun place to do a meetup and do a little ghost hunting. That's one thing I'm hoping to do as I get into the new year in 2019 is maybe trying to do some more ghost hunts as a group rather than just meetups for ghost tours. Because that's a little bit more in my wheelhouse. I'm more interested in doing that now. Yes, I just admitted that I'm gravitating towards spirit tempting. Love to have you check out the website at historygoesbump.com. And if you want to send me some feedback, you can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. I wanted to share something that Ashley had posted in the Spooktacular crew. She says, so I work early mornings, 12 to 9, stocking at a chain craft store in the Chesapeake Bay area. Both my coworkers, managers, and myself swear this store is haunted. 
Shadows out of the corner of your eye, faded voices, the call buttons on radios that others leave on going off when you're just about ready to hit the button. Two recent experiences really freaked me out. First one was when I went into the back to talk to my manager and one of the radios was going completely nuts, beeping, like an alarm type bleeping. The next one was when my manager and myself came back off of break. Somehow my Pandora was playing this crazy ethereal music. We were the only ones in the building and I had closed out my Pandora before I'd left for work. The consensus is that he was someone who fell on the bad side of the mob as the mall across the street used to be a racetrack. So they're thinking maybe somebody got done in because they owed somebody some money. Thanks for sharing that, Ashley. Still been collecting all kinds of ghost stories from you guys for the Halloween special. You can keep those coming in till about the week before Halloween. I'll probably cut them off so that I can get everything recorded for the Halloween special. So if you've had a haunting experience, it doesn't have to be in a historic location. Please send those to me at historyghostbump at gmail.com. I have a few reviews from Apple Podcasts to share. First up is Jimmy Josh 86 Fun five stars. Fun show to listen to, especially around Halloween time. Also have a Duran wonderful show, five stars. I'm new to the podcast brought over by Hillbilly Horror Stories. I love the skeptic way they present the show, as well as them covering the history and the paranormal happenings. Well, thank you. And so glad that you heard about us from Jerry and Tracy over at Hillbilly Horror Stories. Listener 954, a genuine and generous ghostly podcast. Five stars. I love the history and diversity of ghostly experiences. The Gettysburg episode was a favorite. Diane finds so many creative ways to involve her listeners. My favorite ghost podcast. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Glad we're your favorite. And I do try to find ways to make it so that we are a community. Sometimes it feels kind of lonely on one side of the mic or the other. Right now we're doing our virtual trick-or-treat so you guys can all get to know each other a little bit better and share secret Santa-type gifts with each other. We have a cemetery bingo coming up. We're going to do this the last Sunday of October, which is the 28th. We are putting together a card right now. Everybody's going to have just one card to work with, and we'll see who gets the most on that bingo card doing it blackout. So mark your calendars for that. And if you didn't tune into the anniversary show, you missed some fabulous stories that were written by your fellow listeners. We had a really great collection this year, as we have every year. You guys are so talented. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I've been your host, Diane. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We'd like to welcome into the cemetery, Jonathan Smith. You will be getting a marble headstone. Nicole Mercado Champagne, you will be getting a chest tomb. And Nicole Cardarelli, you will be getting a garden crypt. And I want to thank Karen Miller for increasing your pledge. We're going to be moving your body to a garden crypt. All right, Mort, you got some work to do. To Nicole's. Yes, Mort, to Nicole's. A little bit of synchronicity, wouldn't you say? Synchronicity. The police. Yes, I know that song by the police, Mort, but that's not what I'm talking about. Many miles away, something crawls from the slime. Fan of the show? Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast catcher. We would greatly appreciate your review at iTunes as well to help the show grow. Thank you.